Hello everyone, today we're talking about Unearthed Arcana, the playtest 6 for the player's handbook. We're talking about multiple classes. We are talking about the Bard, the Cleric, the Druid, the Rogue, the Ranger, and the Paladin, all today. And the Monk. And the Monk! That's right, the Monk! There are, <laughs> the se there are seven classes Perfect. in this Unearthed Arcana. Okay, so go ahead and hit two times speed on this YouTube video. <laughs> <laughs> this is the time to start, <laughs> because we're going to dive into all of it. Should we start with the Bard? Let's go through an alphabetical order. So there are some changes to the Bard that we're going to be seeing in Unearthed Arcana, and what subclasses do we get? So each class has a number of refinements in it, as well as the subclasses. So I recommend everyone watching these videos to go to the classes and subclasses and read the little update lists for all of the details. While you and I can kind of talk about the overview, right. but there is so much material here that we'd be here for three hours if we went in and talked about each little thing. And remember there are the designer notes. Like those yes. are very, very helpful for each of these classes. The exactly. designer notes kind of walk you through what has changed. Exactly. In the Bard, we have a new version of Vicious Mockery. This cantrip is now Bard exclusive, and as a part of making it Bard exclusive, we have increased its damage. The spell now, rather than dealing 1d4 damage, deals 1d6. One of the biggest new things in the Bard is we're experimenting in this new version of the class with allowing you to choose which of the three big spell lists, Arcane, Divine, or Primal, is your primary spell list as a bard. <laughs> so investigating the playtest feedback that we've gotten on the bard, not only as a part of this playtest, but over the past many years since D&D Next, people love the bard's flexibility. This idea of being sort of the jack of all trades, not only with skills, but also with magic as represented by magical secrets. And so what we've decided to do is, what if we embed that right there in the main spellcasting feature of the class, where you decide as a bard player, is my bard an arcane bard, a primal bard, or a divine bard, which then pushes you in some very different directions thematically and also in terms of the spells that are available to you to cast. This then builds really nicely up to Magical Secrets at 10th level, where then it's opened up and just as in 2014, you can start picking spells from any of the three big spell lists. And so really we've, re we've leaned into the flexibility of this class to be the dabbler, the magical performer who is dipping into different areas uh, to get their magical power, just as they also have you know, broad uh, ability with skills, they also get expertise. Bards are all about using whatever tools are available to them uh, to entertain people, uh, to mess with their enemies, uh, and to bolster their friends. How do you see, besides the spell list, what makes them unique between like a primal bard, just in your head, a primal bard, you know, arcane bard, a divine bard? Some of the main ways in which your bard will end up not only be f being flavored differently, but having different functionality, is if you choose, say, the primal list, which, by the way, is a nice nod to the first edition bard, because the first edition bard did not have their own spell list, but instead were, were required to kind of work their way through elements of other classes. And that uh, included yeah. getting druid spells. Right. And so being able to have a primal bard is actually a really nice nod to the original bard <laughs> back in the 1970s because bards back then were associated with druids, uh, in addition to bards getting to dabble in many other areas. So let's say you choose that primal path for your bard. That means you're going to have magic that rather than focusing on bolstering and beguiling people, you're going to have magic that can influence nature, uh, can you know 
summon and guide animals. You can, you know, this is going to be the the bard who can play their flute and lead along, you know, the the swarm of rats or <laughs> or or whatnot. This is in contrast to the arcane bard, who is the sort of classic illusionist and enchanter bard. Uh, and then the divine bard is, you can imagine a bard who honed their performance craft mm. in a temple or a shrine, and they will be able to use their magic to heal people, uh, to buff people, while still having also powerful enchantment capabilities in the form of spells like command or calm emotions. And so with each one, you get to decide, you know, do you, with arcane, do you want to be more of the enchanter illusionist? Or do you want to be, you know, dancing or playing music or telling a story that causes vines to move mm -hmm. as a primal bard? Uh, or again, do you want to be like the temple singer or dancer who was a part of a religious order? And that's how you developed uh, your musical ability. Um, I'm very excited for those, these distinctions. Those all make perfect sense for the bard. Uh, and the, we've got this new 20th level feature specifically to words. <laughs> yes, so uh, we talk about in the bard story this idea that the multiverse uh, was spoken and signed into existence with the words of creation, which are echoed by spells like power word heal and power word kill. And so we thought, why not make bards the class who are just guaranteed to have power word heal and power word kill and are able to cast them in a way that is more potent than others. And so part of the words of creation feature is that a bard who casts power word heal or power word kill can target two creatures with the spell rather than one. This UA also includes a new version of power word heal that turns it into a ranged spell so that it interacts better, not only with this feature, but so that it functions like the other power word spells. Mm. As we go through and examine every element of the game, we look for places like this where we can refine something so that it will be even more fun and interact better with other things in the game. And so the change to power word heal is an example of this, where you know this, this ninth level spell would be way better, not as a touch spell, uh, but as like the other power word uh, spells, something you can do at a distance. Your magic is wrapped in words. Like yes. sometimes like back to like Welsh mythology of knowing the true names of things. And these are words that aren't just spoken. They can be signed, they can be written. Right. Uh, so it's, you can have a bard who's totally silent, uh, who is working this powerful magic. And that leads into the brand new subclass in this Unearthed Arcana for the Bard, and that is the College of Dance. Yes. This is a subclass we've wanted to do for a long time uh, because dance, of course, is an important type of performance. And I'm excited for people to play with this subclass as we have been doing uh, at the office and seeing what it's like to play a Bard who is all about using their body to work their magic. And there are features in this subclass that uh, allow this bard to be good at unarmed strikes, who can use their bardic inspiration to help other people move with them. So you can almost, you can almost uh, imagine this bard doing like flash mobs, you know, like <laughs> they able to suddenly cause a whole group of people to move with them, Perfect. boost people's initiative, that kind of thing. Uh, and again, as an example of us exploring uh, the, a fuller artistic landscape for this class that is all about the arts and performance. When it comes to the cleric, as we previously mentioned, there have been some changes. We have divine order now, as well as some changes to divine intervention. Lots of divine things have been changed. <laughs> That's right. So the cleric... Uh, was received very well in our previous playtest, and 
So really here we're focused on this class on doing fine tuning. And so there are a variety of things that have been fine tuned, not only in the class, but also in the subclasses. But I think two of the main things that we've done are with those divine features you mentioned. So divine order, a feature that in our previous cleric playtest was called holy order, has moved from second level to first level. It was a really popular feature, and really the main thing that people wanted was to get it even sooner than second level. We've also, in the process of moving it to first level, uh, we have essentially merged the previous Thaumaturge and Scholar options into a single option called Thaumaturge. So now in Divine Order you decide whether to have the Protector uh, option or the Thaumaturge option. This allows you right out of the gate with your Cleric to decide, am I going to be clad in heavy armor or am I going to go in the Thaumaturge route, have an additional cantrip and have a bonus to any of my intelligence religion checks equal to my wisdom modifier. So this is in essence a, a, a choice that was previously in 2014 built into individual subclasses. Well, where it wasn't actually a choice because in the 2014 version of these subclasses, uh, you would have either heavy armor proficiency uh, or an additional cantrip or the like given to you by your subclass. Now you get to choose which of those things you get mm. in this divine order feature. And so this is an example of us taking something that previously you had no control over and we're now letting you decide. Similar thing we do at a higher level in the class where we take uh, the potent spell casting and Divine Strikes features that were previously built into subclasses, and they are now built into the core class. Now, Divine Intervention. The main playtest feedback we've gotten for a long time on Divine Intervention is for it to function in a way that is more reliable for the cleric. Right. Anyone who has used the 2014 version of the feature knows there is not only a uh, element of randomness in whether the cleric's deity is even listening. Yeah. But even if you're successful on your, your role, there's sort of a mother may I interaction with the DM yeah. on the form in which that intervention takes. People have really wanted the cleric to be able to do something more reliable. So with that in mind, we have redesigned both divine intervention and greater divine intervention to give the cleric greater certainty. So divine intervention, what it allows the cleric to do is choose any divine spell, a fifth level or lower, and cast it. It can be a spell they do not have prepared. Uh, they do not have to provide material components for it. Uh, this means, for instance, a cleric, oh, and they cast it uh, as an action. So. This divine intervention could be, for instance, a cleric casting Ray's Dead, yep. not needing yep. <laughs> not needing a material component and doing it in an action. So that is powerful divine intervention that we can give with no random roll uh, and no sort of DM negotiation. You've ruined the diamond market in the game. <laughs> <laughs> All these NPCs that have been selling diamonds, you've just destroyed their economy. <laughs> Uh, but again, you have to be a high-level cleric to be able to do this. Greater divine intervention then turns up the volume on that of allowing the cleric to essentially do what the wish spell does using mm -hmm. the careful parameters set up in that spell. And we decided to use that spell as the framework for greater divine intervention precisely because it already has built in a, a framework that D and D fans understand on like what's reasonable for right. this this you know magical swinging for the fences to actually accomplish, uh, and so I think it's going to be a lot of fun for clerics to now know the form that their divine intervention is going to take. And that makes a lot of sense too. If you get wildly strange in your wish, you know, you know, even when it was just like for wizards. 
um, that can backfire on you. And now it kind of has like a different flavor if it, you are asking this of your deity mm -hmm. and you've gone a little far afield, maybe a little arrogant in your request. <laughs> there might be some negative repercussions yeah. as well. Yep. Yeah, different yeah. theme. That's perfect. Anything else? Uh, again, a lot of really nice details uh, in the cleric subclasses. Yeah. Uh, I am excited for people to try out uh, the new version of the trickery domain. Yes. Uh, we have made it so that uh, the duplicate that you create is far easier to use. Uh, you're now able to create it as a bonus action rather than as an action. Perfect. And I think the whole subclass works together more tightly. And where... That makes it better for combat. Absolutely. Yeah, you, you can pop that as a bonus action then and make your attack and get that advantage. And uh, we've also done things like in uh, the light domain, we combined two of the features so that you get a higher level function for your warding flare earlier, right. which then allowed us to create a brand new feature in the space opened up. So I encourage everyone to dig in because you're going to find new features, uh, improved features, all over the place. And again, the design notes kind of walk you through. What, this is why I really love, because rather than taking my 2014 rule book and comparing it to this, uh, I, you, you kind of outline like, okay, this is what changed, this got merged, That's it's nice. It's like I, having director's commentary on the play test. Exactly, so. yeah, yeah, everyone. Please don't don't go looking for the needle in the haystack. We <laughs> we we let you know in those design notes uh, yeah. which features are new and which features have changed. Um, so we've got life domain, we've got light domain, and we've got the trickery domain. My favorite cleric. Yes, <laughs> we also have the war domain. We do have the war domain in this. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. So yeah, we have four. Every class has has four subclasses. Uh, but in a few cases, the fourth subclass, uh, we just point you to Tasha's Cauldron of Everything where you can find the subclass to use with the playtest. So we've obviously seen a lot of changes with the Druid. We're seeing more changes here with this playtest. Let's dive into that and the subclasses. So there is a lot to ingest and enjoy <laughs> in this version of the Druid. So we... Uh, took in all of the feedback from the previous Druid. You and I talked in another video yeah. about the direction we were likely to go in with the next Druid, and that Druid is here. Right. So this Druid has new features, a new version of Wild Shape, an entirely new subclass, uh, another subclass, two other subclasses that are entirely redesigned. Yeah. So the Druid... Uh, has a lot of goodies here. That starts with a brand new feature called Primal Order at first level. This is akin to the Cleric's Divine Order, where now the Druid gets to decide if they want better armor uh, at first level, or if they would like to lean more onto the magical side of their character. That armor choice becomes especially significant if you decide to play a Circle of the Moon Druid, because in the new Circle of the Moon Druid, you have the option when you're in wild shape to use either your AC or the beast's right. AC, whichever is higher. And so we wanted to build into the base class the ability for a Druid, whether they have the Circle of the Moon or one of the other subclasses, the ability to be more resilient if they decide to be in melee. Con in contrast, we also wanted other druids, if they want to emphasize their nature spellcasting, to be able to choose that option in primal order that gives them an additional cantrip and also gives them a bonus on their skill, ch their ability checks rather that use the nature skill. We also have in the Druid a brand new feature called Elemental Fury, which allows the Druid to enhance either the damage of their cantrips right. or the damage of their melee attacks, including melee attacks in wild shape. And one of the things that we are exploring throughout this version of the Druid is fully supporting either the wild shape focused druid or the spellcasting focused druid. And so you're going to find 
throughout this version of the Druid, that is a recurring theme that you get to decide as a Druid player what you want to focus on. Uh, that's why we also introduce in, in this version of the class a sort of limited ability to turn wild shape uses into spell slots and spell slots into wild shape uses. So that, again, let's say you're a spellcasting focused druid and you're like, I don't need all these wild shape uses. Right. You instead could create a spell slot. And we also give you ways to use your wild shape uses in your subclasses, other than Circle of the Moon, uh, that are not about turning into a beast. This is a design theme we've been exploring for years in the Druid. It's something that you can see in the Druid subclasses in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, of using wild shape uses to do something other than turning into a beast. So there's a whole lot more of that here. Wild shape uh, has been redesigned. Uh, looking at the playtest feedback, it was clear that even though many people loved the new version of the Druid that appeared in the previous Druid playtest, there were more people who wanted the version of Wild Shape that they had in 2014. So what we've done is we've taken the 2014 version of Wild Shape and we've refined it. The main refinements are, one, you no longer get hit points from the forms that you turn into because, as we've discussed before, getting all those extra hit points uh, ended up causing the druid, especially at high level, to have a resilience that the rest of the game's math didn't know what to do with. Right. Uh, the druid was really overtuned. Uh, but fear not, the circle of the moon, though, in this new version does get temporary hit points when they turn into uh, a wild shape form. Now, what all druids now get though, even though they're not getting hit points from the forms, is we have removed the detail from 2014 that caused you to be knocked out of a wild shape form after taking an amount of damage equal to the creature's hit points. What this means is you can now stay in your wild shape form until you drop, you the druid drop to zero hit points. And this is going to allow druids in many cases to stay in wild shape form longer than they ever could in the 2014 version. Except for again, some high level cases where right. they were getting so many extra hit points. This is a case of, I think a really nice balance being struck of sure, you're not gonna have sort of a runaway amount of hit points anymore. Right but you will often be able to stay in wild shape longer than you ever could before. Uh, we've also made it so that wild turning into your beast form with wild shape is now a bonus action for all druids, not just circle of the moon. This is going to make it so that wild shape has a tactical utility for all druids. You might even be a spellcasting focused druid, but because wild shape is now a bonus action, mm -hmm. you might decide that in the middle of a fight, if you're high enough level to turn into a flying beast, oh, I'm gonna quickly turn into a flying beast, get to the other side of that, yeah. that chasm, turn back into a druid and cast a spell from over there. So we're finding in our play tests that just that change of making wild shape a bonus action for all druids really opens up the tactical landscape for the class in a really fun way. Uh, we've also made it so that uh, druids can t continue now to talk uh, in wild shape form. So there are a number of really nice enhancements uh, to the 2014 wild shape that appears here. Finally, because we do want to control how many beast forms are available to a druid, rather than the DM having to face a druid who could turn into any CR appropriate beast that has appeared anywhere in the game, <laughs> a druid is now required to essentially prepare a number of beast forms each day. Oh, okay, yeah. So the number you can prepare, sort of like a number of spells, will increase as you go up in level. It starts at three. So when you start out, you will have three forms that you can prepare. Every time you finish a long rest, you can change uh, that list. Uh, what this allows a group to do is 
to know what the druid can turn into, and also, most especially, the DM to know what the, the druid can turn into. <laughs> yeah. This will also be a godsend for druid players because it means that you can prep your stat blocks that you can turn into in advance. Rather than having that sort of looming idea that at any moment, oh, do I need to dive into every monster book that's been published and quickly find the stat block that's right for any given situation. Again, like spell preparation, you're going to have your forms that you've prepared in advance, uh, and then you know those are the forms that will potentially appear in play in that current session. If that's not enough. <laughs> yes, but wait, there's more. <laughs> yeah. uh, we did a lot on the Druid. So uh, Circle of the Moon and Circle of the Land uh, both appear here, uh, along with uh, the Circle of the Sea. The fourth subclass for the Druid is the Circle of the Stars, and for that we say just go to Tasha's, right. and, and you can find the subclass there. Circle of the Land and Circle of the Moon have received so many enhancements, they're almost new subclasses. So uh, Circle of the Land, for instance, you now pick from a list of four land types each day, and you get the spells associated with that. Right. This is a huge change from 2014, where you chose a list of spells when you chose the subclass, and then that was your list forever. forever. Now, every day, the Circle of the Land Druid can attune to a different land type and get a list of spells associated with it. There are some other really fun new things here. The Circle of the Land has a new way to use Wild Shape, uh, where they can uh, burn a use of wild shape to create a burst of sort of magical foliage and thorns in an area right. that can damage foes and heal a friend. The healing blossoms option that was in the previous druid is not in the core druid now. We essentially took it and moved it into the circle of the land and then combined it also with the ability to damage some people in that area. Circle of the Land also is now going to be able to sort of call up a nature sanctuary in an area that provides protection uh, to the Druid's allies in that area. Circle of the Moon, one of the big pieces of feedback we received in the last UA as well as to the 2014 version of it is people wanting the theme to be clearer. Circle of the Moon, Lunar. Yeah. And so what we've done is we have made that Lunar theme a through line in this new version of the subclass. So th this now means that when you're in beast form, you can call down the Moonbeam spell, for yeah. instance. Uh, we have uh, made it so that you can change your beast form's damage into radiant damage as you strike uh, people with the magic of the moon. Uh, we've also made it that in addition to you being able to get more temporary hit points as you go up in level when you turn into your beast forms, we've made it so you'll eventually be able to give flight to any of your beast forms, even if they don't have it, as you turn into this sort of lunar animal, uh, you know, the moon wolf, or, you know, the- Yeah, when does the, that happen? When do I get to be bat wolf? <laughs> uh, well, you don't even have to sprout wings, because again, you are, you are uh, surrounded by uh, the magic of the moon. Right. And then on top of that, we have a brand new subclass here, the circle of the sea. Uh, we've realized that, uh, over the years, as we've released different subclasses for this class focused on nature, we had a big gap, and that is oceans. And so we uh, had fun designing the Circle of the Sea, which not only deals with some of the things you'd expect, you know, water, uh, being able to breathe underwater, you know, swimming, that kind of thing, but also, uh, we've incorporated elements of storms because so often, you know, storms rumble over the sea. And so this is, this is a druid of, you know, the oceans and thunder, uh, and I think is going to be a lot of fun for people to try out. Fantastic, yeah. I, the Circle of Land in particular, that's, fan, that's so great tactically, because you can either be on theme and be in the Arctic and have cult-based spells, but smarter would be like, 
I'm throwing out fireball and other fire damaging spells, so tactically it makes more sense. But you can kind of move it to the thing that you're on. Yes. I like that a lot. Yeah, and Circle of the Land is very much now quintessential nature magician. Right. And that, that was the lens uh, that we looked through as we refined that subclass. So we've got the monk. We've got some pretty significant changes to the monk. Let's do this. I know a lot of people have been asking this whole time, where's the monk? Where's the monk? So let's so, talk about it. So the monk has been in our internal playtesting for quite a while now. And one of our main goals with the monk is to get its output right. Because we have been concerned for a number of years that the monk's damage output has not been where it should be relative to other classes. And so... To me, one of the main things <laughs> about the monk is that your martial arts die progression has all moved up one die. Yeah. And so rather than starting at a D4, you now start at a D6 and it goes all the way up to a D12. So in a way we could just say that and that's enough <laughs> for, for a, exciting yeah. changes for this class yeah. because uh, monks now are really going to be able to punch at the weight that they should have been all along. But of course, we've done more. Uh, we, we have uh, brand new features in this class. The monk now gets weapon mastery. So in addition to their enhanced unarmed combat, right. monks also now get to play around with the fun options in weapon mastery and get to then explore some amazing tactical combos when you start thinking about combining yeah. certain weapon mastery properties with then also certain features in monk subclasses as well as in the base class. We also have uh, a new feature in the monk called deflect energy. This is an often, <laughs> an often requested thing in the class. So in the, in the past, of course, uh, monks could deflect like arrows, you yeah. know, catch them, throw them back. Throw them back, that kind of thing. Well, at high level now, the monk can go even further. I'm so and, excited. And like that firebolt that comes in, that yeah. monk can bat that firebolt away. <laughs> uh, and super fun, super cinematic. Yeah. And really leans into uh, the monk having this sort of fine control, not only of themselves, uh, but of the battlefield around them. Right. And that that fine control is a theme here. Uh, it's why, you know, we now call their main uh, resource discipline points because uh, monks are all about this self-discipline that yeah. allows them to pull off these sometimes supernatural effects. Uh, and The first time I get to grab a magic missile out of the air or Eldritch Blast and... <laughs> I'm not just going to deflect it. I'm going to like theme it that I just like throw it back. Like I hold on to him for a second, look at it, and then toss it back at someone. I'm going to laugh. So I, I hate to break it to you. No, I was wondering about magic missile. It's that not going to work with magic oh, missile. Oh, come on. Ma like one of them. No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> because there are multiple, multiple are hitting you at once. No, so no, it's because magic missile is that special thing in the game. Well, it always hits. For the monk to deflect something, it has to be an attack roll that hits you. And magic missile, part of its core identity is that it bypasses such things. I mean, that's why Magic Missile is so iconic. Uh, but I like the idea of grabbing Eldritch Blast and throwing it back, back mm -hmm. at a Warlock. That's mm -hmm. hilarious to me. There's other stuff for the monk. Uh, yes. Uh, in addition to uh, a lot of fine tuning in the core class, uh, we have completely redesigned the subclass that was formerly known as the Way of the Four Elements. So that subclass was the lowest rated subclass in the 2014 Player's Handbook. Yeah. And looking at the feedback that we've received over the years on it and sort of faced with, do we simply refine it or completely go back to the drawing board? We completely went back to the drawing board. And so what you see here is a subclass that is able to use their discipline points 
in a way that I think is going to be super satisfying as they create explosions of elemental power on the battlefield, right. uh, are able to f uh, power up their unarmed strikes with elemental energy. Extend their reach. Yeah, they're yeah. able to extend their reach. Many of the capabilities that in 2014 were embedded in some of the spell options, what we've done instead is taken those, moved them into the subclass itself, yeah. and allowed you to get a lot of the same feel, but without looping through spells, and also without spending such a punishing number of points. Yeah. Because, because the 2014, that spell casting, one of the reasons why it was unpopular is the options were simply too expensive. And so the, the monk was often running out of their points super fast and then felt like they were then reduced to just punching or hitting somebody with a weapon, while other monks were able to keep going longer with some of their subclass distinctive capabilities. So now, uh, the Way of the Four Elements, now called Warrior of the Elements, is now able to essentially uh, stand side by side with other monk classes, subclasses rather, and be just as potent as they are. Uh, we also have we have a variety of subclasses in here. We've got Warrior of the Shadow. Yes, we have uh, Warrior of Shadow and also Warrior of the Hand. Uh, and then the fourth subclass is Warrior of Mercy. And for that, you just go to Tasha's and use the Way of Mercy that is there. Now, of course, in the 2024 book, any subclass that we're currently just pointing you to a book for will appear in the player's handbook. So Warrior of Shadow has been more refined. Like, you can move the darkness around the battlefield. It's yes. tactical. That's, that is a big, a big change in Warrior of Shadow, and that is... Uh, you were able to create darkness as you could in 2014, but now you can move that darkness and you can see in it. Yes. <laughs> so that combination of things is fantastic. We've also lessened the subclass's reliance on spells and it gets more of the capabilities that before came through spells just directly through its features. That is, a, it's like a very simple change that Changes the battlefield quite significantly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we have got the Paladin as well, and a variety of subclasses. What has changed in this playtest? So the Paladin in the previous playtest was very well received. People liked it. So what we're doing here is refinement right. uh, and taking things that people liked and responding to the feedback and seeing if we can make those things even more fun. Uh, so. One thing the Paladin gets that's new that wasn't in the previous playtest is weapon mastery. Right. So now, uh, just like their fighter friends, they will be able to swim around in the weapon mastery pool. Uh, we also have listened to feedback that people would like to be able to interweave Lay on Hands more with their other features. And so Lay on Hands is now a bonus action instead of an action. Uh, meaning you can reach out, heal somebody, yeah. and still attack on yeah. the same turn. Perfect. We also have a revised version of the Fine Steed spell. This is now a Paladin exclusive spell, and it now takes only an action to cast it. Uh, one of the things we could do by making it Paladin exclusive is also allow Paladins to get their Divine Steed onto the battlefield faster than ever before. Uh, we also have further revised all of the smite spells in response to feedback previously. And we now give the Paladin all but two of the smite spells as a part of the Paladin smite feature. So we've renamed the Divine Smite feature to Paladin Smite and that smite feature now gives you, as you level up, different smite spells, and you always now have them prepared. We also have, looking at the feedback of people wishing the sort of smite family effects worked in a more consistent way, we are testing in this playtest a version of Divine Smite that is itself a spell. Functionally, 
Divine Spite, Divine Smite has always basically been a spell. Yeah. Uh, it was just printed out in uh, the class feature. To create what people have desired, this sense of the smite effects all being a part of sort of a cohesive family of effects, we've now brought Divine Smite into that family fully by making it a spell and then also tweaking all of the spells so you now have this really fun menu of smite options. Uh, in the process of turning Divine Smite into a spell, we've also brought back uh, there being extra damage to fiends and undead, which is something people requested. Uh, also a part of Paladin Smite is that each day, the Paladin will be able to cast one of those Smite spells without expending a spell slot. In the previous playtest, we put the free casting into each of the subclasses in their Oath Spells feature. What we've done here is we've now instead moved that free casting into the Paladin Smite feature. The reason we've done that is we put the free casting in Oath Spells because Paladins use so many of their spell slots on Smites. Uh, and we realized rather than putting this feature in every subclass, we could just put it once <laughs> in the base class and put it right there in Paladin Smite. And I think people are really going to enjoy now feeling like they have meaningful smite options when they look at each of these smite spells that they get as they level up as a paladin. Part of this change has also been that all of the smite spells, except for two, Searing Smite and Wrathful Smite, are now paladin exclusive. They do not appear on the divine spell list. Uh, some of the feedback we got was that people were uncomfortable with clerics being able to smite uh, just as well in that, and, and eventually even better than yeah. paladins. <laughs> and we, we listened to that feedback, and so now there are only two smite spells on the divine list. That's Searing Smite and Wrathful Smite. All of the others belong just to the paladin, and they are acquired with this paladin smite feature. Perfect. Uh, and what are the subclasses we're taking a look at? Uh, the Paladin has uh, Oath of Devotion, Oath of the Ancients, Oath of Vengeance, uh, along with uh, the Oath of Glory. Perfect. And uh, each of those subclasses has uh, seen a number of refinements. Uh, and because we have moved the subclass progression back to its 2014 form, that means the Paladin's Capstone subclass features have all now returned to 20th level, which means we've been able to restore uh, their right. gobsmacking power uh, because <laughs> yeah. they're, they're once again 20th level features. Right, perfect. Uh, all right. So the Ranger in our previous playtest was super popular. So our goal in this version is to protect what was popular, and then fine-tune some things to hopefully make what is now a beloved class. Right. Uh, we, we've talked about it being our most improved. Uh, we want to like, keep that momentum going. So the main changes here is we have replaced at low level the expertise feature that we had in the previous playtest with a feature called Deft Explorer. It's a nod to a feature that we introduced in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. And in this feature, it includes expertise, but then also uh, some of the terrain choice that people enjoyed from the 2014 Ranger. It's been framed in a new way, so it can be more broadly applicable, uh, but people did want a little bit of that, that in-world flavor restored, and we were glad to do it. Uh, the Ranger also now gets uh, Weapon Mastery and will get to enjoy trying out Weapon Mastery properties, whether they're an up-close dual-wielding Ranger, yeah. a, a far-off Ranger, or something in between. Uh, and we've also built into the class uh, the acquisition of the Conjure Barrage spell. Uh, it is now a Ranger-exclusive spell that explicitly works with melee weapons as well as ranged weapons, 
and has had its damage increased. Uh, and so this, it's essentially a new spell. <laughs> it's, uh, and uh, I think uh, rangers are gonna have a lot of fun using it to uh, essentially spray uh, magical blades or arrows yeah. or whatever their weapon of choice is across the battlefield. Uh, we also have uh, tweaked Hunter's Mark uh, to make it not only Ranger exclusive, but also if you cast it uh, with higher level slots, its damage now goes up. Uh, Hunter's Mark though also now has its damage limited to only once per turn. Uh, we've known for quite some time that Hunter's Mark, if its extra damage is exploited too many times on a turn, yeah. Uh, actually causes it to be more powerful uh, than it should be for a first level spell. Uh, we made a similar change to the Hex spell in the previous Unearthed Arcana, where again, that extra damage needs to be uh, activated no more than once per turn. Uh, but then that's also why in both spells, we've made it so that that damage goes up if you invest a higher level spell slot uh, in the casting. We also have in the Ranger a entirely new version of the Beastmaster. And uh, a big piece of this was previewed in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, where we introduced uh, alternative versions of the Beast Companions. Well, now we've, we've unveiled what the whole subclass looks like, incorporating those primal beasts into the subclass itself. We've got the Gloomstalker. Yes, uh, the Gloomstalker, which originally was in Xanathar's Guide to Everything, has emerged from the darkness uh, <laughs> into this playtest well with a number of uh, really fun enhancements. Right. So people are going to see a uh, new version of a Xanathar's Guide subclass here and get to try it out. And we've also made some changes to the Hunter subclass, which appeared in the previous playtest. The main feedback we got on the new version of the Hunter was that people wanted to see some of the feature options return that appeared in 2014. So we have happily brought those back. And what we've done is then focus on the best ones. One of the reasons why in the previous playtest we experimented with removing the options is that we knew some of the options in the 2014 Hunter were suboptimal and were essentially traps. Well, now, rather than getting rid of the options and just including uh, what we thought was the best option in sort of the, uh, the broader context of the subclass, we've brought back the ability for you to choose among a menu of options, but what we've done is preserve only the good ones uh, and have now also let you even uh, double up on some of the options that used to be mutually exclusive. So they used to be like there would be three options and you could only pick one of them. Mm -hmm. We've now given the hunter the ability at a higher level to go back to that sub menu and pick another one. Nice. Uh, so what we have found in our play tests is this now makes the hunter even juicier uh, than before. And I think people are going to really enjoy it. Rogues. Oh man. So, uh, the rogue in this playtest, uh, I am super excited about. Uh, this is the class uh, most recently in an our, our internal playtests that I have been playing a lot myself. And the class, the base class, gets a number of new tasty options. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> uh, starting with Weapon Mastery, rogues too now uh, are going to get to play with Weapon Mastery. and. I can now say that when we designed Weapon Mastery, several of the mastery properties, uh, and I'm thinking here of ones like uh, Nick, are yeah. were designed basically with the rogue in mind. So I'm so glad now to be able to send out to the world the version of the rogue with the Weapon Mastery options that were basically designed for the rogue. Uh, for those watching at home, Nick is a property of, say, having a dagger. Yep. That allows you to attack with a dagger and then also follow up with an extra attack. Yep, basically. yep, yeah, you get that that little nice freebie attack. So stabby stabby for rogues. Yes. <laughs> now that they 
can use that weapon mastery. Uh, we have also imported into the class a popular feature that we introduced in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, Steady Aim. Right. And so now uh, all rogues will have Steady Aim as an option. It's a way to help ensure that you're going to have advantage on your next attack. And then the thing I'm most excited about uh, that is the result of us restoring the 2014 subclass progression is we reopened, there was sort of a gap in the rogues level progression in 2014 uh, between its subclass levels. And it sort of had this kind of dry spell yeah. in between. Yeah. Well, that ended up being super fertile ground for us as we've been refining the rogue to create a new feature called Cunning Strike. This feature has been so fun in playtesting because what it now allows the rogue to do is whenever the rogue hits with their sneak attack, the rogue has the option of trading one or more of their sneak attack dice in for a special effect instead of damage. Right. So for instance, you could forego 1d6 of your sneak attack's damage to knock someone prone or to poison them uh, and so yes. on and so forth. <laughs> and, <Yes. laughs> and it in play has been fantastic because oh. uh, there are times where, sure, dealing as much damage as possible is what you want. Right. And you can still do that. But then there are other times where it's far more advantageous to use your sneak attack to knock a person down, along with still dealing a juicy amount of damage, yeah. uh, or uh, to disarm them, uh, because that's also one of the options, uh, or to move as a part of your sneak attack. Yes. Uh, and then at higher level uh, in the class, we now introduce even more of these cunning strike options in a feature called devious strikes, where then you also are able to forego multiple dice to do things like instantly knocking somebody out, right. uh, non-lethally. Yeah. Uh, like, well, I'm just, bam, they're down. Uh, and there are several other options like that that really alter the tactical landscape for this class in, in all sorts of exciting ways. And then on top of that with Weapon Mastery, you've, yes. you've just got a lot of fun features to play with. It just makes it like, Again, more tactical. Like, yes. If you really want to do a deep dive into like all the little things you can do, it, you, there's so much to do. Yeah. It's it's really exciting. Yeah. Um, the, and, and the poison condition right now, how is it in playtest? It's the same one that we saw in 2014. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. And uh, that poison theme is something that people will also see in the revised assassin uh, that appears in this playtest. Uh, the Assassin in 2014 got proficiency with the Poisoner's Kit, but really didn't have anything in the subclass that did anything with that. Yeah. So we've now rectified that, that the Assassin now uh, has the ability uh, to administer some potent poison. Uh, but more excitingly for the Assassin is we have now removed the reliance of their sort of banner assassinate feature right. on the surprise state. So right. it no longer requires somebody to be surprised for the assassin to pull this off. Uh, the assassin still needs to act before that person, right. but they needn't be surprised. And we've also made it so that assassins now have advantage on initiative roles. So <laughs> it's going to be much easier for assassins to act before other people on the battlefield. Then there's like good combat synergy if you choose something like the alert feat, mm -hmm. a trade initiative, and that kind of thing. Yep. It starts getting really nasty yeah. uh, on top of everything else. I like that like we're, you're pushing the poisoned feature that, that exists with sneak attack just for the base rogue even further with the assassin. You're kind yeah. of like, you're bringing that fantasy to yeah. the assassin finally. Yeah. And, and that, that is a theme for us in a lot of the work we've been doing with subclasses is how can we really bring the fantasy of that subclass to life. Uh, we did the same thing in the recent revisions to the thief. So uh, what we did is we took the thief that was in the previous playtest 
and turned up the volume on some of the features. So in addition to bringing back the thief's ability to take the use an object action as a bonus action, yeah. we've gone further. We've now made it so that the thief can take the magic action to activate magic items as a bonus action. Yes. And so that <laughs> that now means the thief is going to be able to quaff potions as a bonus action right. and use other magic item uh, properties that normally take an action, the thief can activate them as a bonus action. So if they've got like uh, something that can shoot a fireball. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yeah, yeah. Perfect. And the thief has some other uh, nice tweaks inside, uh, including uh, a new option that builds on Cunning Strike to uh, uh, forego a die of damage when you make a sneak attack while you're hidden to stay hidden. Yes. Uh, so, so the the <laughs> the thief who has you know is perched somewhere can, if they're willing to have their sneak attack deal just a little less damage, can ensure that. Uh, they stay unrevealed. We've got the Arcane Trickster, which is one of my favorite subclasses of all time for a variety of reasons. The thing that excites me the most with this is um, using Mage Hand with the Disarm. Yes. Allowing you to knock an object out of someone's hands, potentially, from at range. So yes, the Arcane Trickster, uh, just as the other subclasses can now play around with the new Cunning Strike feature in the base class, the Arcane Trickster does this by being able to use the trip and disarm options of Cunning Strike yeah. on someone other than the target of your sneak attack. Let's say you're attacking this creature over here, but your Mage Hand is near the creature over there. When you strike that creature, your Mage Hand can try to lift something off the other creature or trip that other creature while they're distracted by what's going on on the battlefield. Uh, we are having a lot of fun of integra uh, integrating Cunning Strike into different places in these various subclasses. Uh, and then we also uh, have a subclass returning, it last appeared in Xanathar's Guide to Everything, the Swashbuckler, with several uh, changes there that we're looking forward to people playtesting.